what does the world we want to live in look like? And then how do we represent it? Because that's the best we can do. We can't force the world to look that way, but we can help create the environment in which we make it look that way. It's Uncommon Good, the podcast where we talk with ordinary people doing uncommon good in service of our common humanity. I'm Polly Reese. Fam, so excited to be welcoming Anthony Veneziali to the show. If you know him from Freestyle Love Supreme, Speechless, the Freestyle Love Supreme Academy, or his brand new company, FLS Plus, you might know him from his stage name, Two Touch. Among other things that he has founded, American Immigrants, a group out in San Francisco, The Freeze, among other incredible companies he's produced content for, The Cartoon Network, The Sesame Street Workshop, Boardwalk Pictures, TED, yes, he has a TED Talk, Google, Adobe, Salesforce, so many, many more. In our chat, we talked about what it was like for him to grow up in Philly, from Northeast all the way up to the suburbs in M. Night Shyamalan territory, what it was like parenting during the pandemic, his strategies of leadership all the way from the ground level to the C-suite, the future of improv, comedy after the lockdowns, an exclusive look at a brand new project coming to the airwaves this spring, and to top it all off, there might be a little bit of musical improv thrown in just for good measure. Friends, so excited for you to enjoy my chat to Anthony. You just ended the primary um, Freestyle Love Supreme tour run. You ended your mic one in fine fashion in Pasadena. (laughs) Are you sleeping eight hours now? Mm. Oh my goodness. I love this question. I am. I sleep, but sleep's always important to me. So even while I was on tour, like I have to get eight hours in. It's yeah. the only like, you know, natural performance enhancing drug that we can take is sleep. Right. So it's like, do it, take it if you can. I'm very lucky. I sleep well. Is that a discipline that you had to develop to get eight hours? Yeah, good question. You know, I always took it for granted until I met my partner and she is not a very good sleeper. Um, and so we kind of like sleep trained with each other doing yeah. um, some sound therapy. So the yeah. Monrovia Institute, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but they're out of Virginia. They do these great sonic sound baths to help mm-hmm. you with sleep therapy to like, you know, get into your, your REM cycle faster and then to deep sleep after thereafter. So it, it definitely was something that you kind of like curate. And then they have these great little nap uh, pods too that last 20 minutes that like yeah. really, really reinvigorate you. I'm picturing like a shower, but with like visual, visualized like waveforms just sort of coming out of like a bunch of different speakers while you stand, I, I guess, in, in your in your pants or something. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you have to make sure you have your speakers placed properly in your room because it's about the way they kind of like hit you in certain yeah. sides. And so like we had to like measure out the room. They have all these specifications about it. Um, and it's really delightful. And then you lay there and it's really true, right? So like sound waves do occupy space and they do wash over you. Um, and so for us, uh, sleeping to the rain was the, the one that we kind of really got into. And it was like just this gorgeous, like a rain stick. Have you ever heard one of those? Like, oh yeah. So it kind of starts out like that. And it, Really what they're trying to do is turn your beta waves into delta waves, which is like nice. the kind of brain emission that happens when you get to those those deep sleep cycles. So yeah, it really helps with it. Rain Six, you just took me back to Mrs. Howell's joint um, second grade art and music <laughs> class project of summer of 19. Her, her, her. Um, her, 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 her exactly where we where we were mailed like paper towel tubes and rice and like Major cardboard boxes shower. yeah and <laughs> like did pa- paper mask yeah and then and then eventually learned better in seventh grade uh on the field trip to the grand canyon and brought like a proper like dried saguaro like wow yeah. um what was so so here here's a thing that i was in, in, intrigued to find out um mm. we have 
some we have common geographical history both of us have a lot of time in sort of philly and like the philly suburbs and yes. you specifically not just not just in like m night Shyamalania like territory <laughs> like out in the suburbs but we also <laughs> have some commonality in northeast philly as well yes Hell what the yes um, tell tell me like like i got here in 2011 when i like mm. after after um the first run of like college and like conservatory but you've been here since like since since childhood what was it like to have philly and the suburbs be like your like your your stomping grounds oh gosh well philly is unique you know it's it's its own ecosystem uh, and it is a very blue collar ecosystem. You know, I, I was born in the seventies yeah. and raised in Philly until I was about five. And then we moved to the suburbs, but every weekend we would come back because, you know, I come from a big Italian family. And if you aren't with yeah. at least 15 of your family members at all times, then it's kind of like, what are you doing? <laughs> so we would always come back and stay at my uncle's and stay at my grandparents uh, mm -hmm. most weekends. So I knew the sound of the joints on I-95 by heart. Like I could tell <laughs> what exit we were by just by how far apart they were spaced. Uh, because, you know, they're elevated for a long time until you get, let's say, like Langhorne exit. And then by the time you get to Langhorne exit, the tarmac sounded totally yeah. different than yeah. it was elevated. Right. So you've got these magnesium lights on 95. You're going past like Allegheny Avenue exit. You're like, All yeah. right, I'm in Northeast. And then you start <laughs> heading out and you're like, see the old signs for Franklin Mills Mall. I mean, come yeah. on, that's an old school shit right there. And then that's also uh, Cromwell Heights, which is where the like commuter park ended up being put in. That's right. And that that's wasn't right. there like until I want to say maybe 1990 or 91 or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, we used to drive in every weekend and Philly. Like I said, it's singular. It's blue collar. It is like yeah. if you're not getting your hands dirty, if you're not like changing a tire yourself or like know how to like use a a wrench, like you're not much of a human being <laughs> in yeah. terms of like grassroots Philly style. Um, and everybody I knew was like infatuated with the Eagles snake bitten by the Phillies uh, <laughs> and, you know, like had all of these like superstitions about how they watched a thing you know because yeah. like the chair that they sat in mattered somehow yeah. to how randall cunningham was going to throw the football that weekend <laughs> um and so it's just a, such this interesting like dialectic between you get your hands dirty you do the work and yet there is some higher power of of mystical forces that are like looking out after you or cursing you or like <laughs> you know there's just there's something there um and it's a heady mixture and um yeah you know philly's philly's also just a great food town so like so yeah. much of the culture there is based around food and like who you get your roast pork from That's all right. right you know also you know don't don't call me uh, a Pat's and Geno's guy. Like that's for tourists. <laughs> what are you standing doing the Philly stance at Pat's and Geno's on Moy Mincing? Like you had to know this is John's Rose Pork, right? Like yeah. everyone goes toward Packer Avenue, Tony Luke's. Like yeah. that's the real deal, Philly deal. And then you let all the other people go to Pat's and Geno's who are come out of town, right? Uh, let's do let's do a speed round, a Philly fast five. Um, <laughs> so. Papal visits, 1979 or 2015? 79. There. Absolutely. And, and John Paul II came to the church that was on Allegheny Avenue. And so did John F. Kennedy. They were like, it was like this, every Italian household yeah. in Philly has John F. Kennedy and Pope uh, John Paul II next to Jesus. Like, that's how you know you're in Philly. <laughs> 100 percent true you already alluded to it uh tony luke's or john's uh jeez i mean if you're gonna get a roast pork sandwich it's john's if you're gonna get a cutlet it's tony luke's mm. reading terminal market or the or the manufacturing district in packer ave i mean packer ave ter reading terminal market like reopened when i was a young kid and we were all like this is fancy <laughs> Um, the, the Japanese tea house in Fairmount Park or the Japanese tea house in the Philadelphia Museum of Art? 
Uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. I love that one. But that's like me being older. That's like, <laughs> that's like me now. Right. Um, Penn's Landing or the Rocky Steps? Oh, God, that's a tough one. Because Penn's Landing is where the Zydeco festivals used to be in the summer. Yep. And we used to yep. love those because I'm a huge Cajun music fan. And so is my dad. Yep. God, it's Penn's Landing for me. Like Rocky Steps are cool. And like, hey, look, we did the thing. But Penn's Landing is where like, you know, great music and great concert happened all throughout the 80s and 90s. Absolutely. Um, the Penny Pack or the Wissahickon? Wissahickon. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely the right call. Um, and and also, um, you heard it here. You you heard it from you heard it from Tony Award winning artist Anthony Viniziali. Um, come to Philly, Top Chef. Yeah, come come tape a show. Come tape a show in Philly. Um, and 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 have Anthony on as a guest judge. He will one hundred percent like judge the hell out of all of the fancy roast pork sandwiches and they better be real they better be real deal you gotta do, have do, a do little we, bit of marble do do we actually need a fancy roast pork sandwich is this necessary no the whole concept of roast pork sandwich is that it's not fancy right yeah. the whole concept is like and it's philly in a nutshell yeah right it's like this and that's why i don't know if you've watched the bear which is a very interesting series, right? Like this whole Chicago sandwich, like that's a big yeah. deal in Chicago, right? It's sort of kind of their version of the cheesesteak or the roast pork sandwich. But there's a lot of that clash right now about like, how do we do it in a way that's kind of a little bit more sustainable too? <laughs> <laughs> Which is not Philly's MO at all. Philly could give a shit less, right? Like they're just trying to get to the end of the day and have a water ice. That's right. A water ice, um, a water ice or, or a yards like um, the or or a victory for that matter or, or, or trogues. Like there's been so much trogues in the in the city recently. I, I like everybody's about Dreamweaver at the moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I want to talk about this concept of uh, of the sort of like this like very sort of blue collar um i might go so far as to to, to add the phrase down to earth ness mm. to philly mm -hmm. about this because yeah. I, I i'm reasonably certain that it's something that that i i see coming through when i see you doing performances when we've worked together in the in the training center component of fls plus formerly fls academy mm. i see i see a level of openness in stage and in presence in your presence when you are facilitating or or any other sort of public facing outward like digestible uh content work mm -hmm. i wonder if you can tell me when we see that as the audience what is the process like to foster like an inward reality that communicates that openness. Hmm. Ooh, gosh, this is a gorgeous and big old question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, I think obviously uh, there's there's all of the influence, right? Nature versus nurture. Um, for me, there's just so much nurture involved in this question, which is like, yeah. you know, I'm the youngest of five boys. Um, right. I'm a bit of a mistake. Uh, I'm younger than my brothers by far. And so getting a scrap at the table was like a, a fight, you know, like, like you kind of mm -hmm. had to really, really sort of stand up for yourself uh, or else yeah. you wouldn't eat. Um, and so there was a bit of like, I want to be seen. I need to be seen um, in order to just exist in this space. Yeah. And, you know, that, that takes on a lot. I, I also had a terrible speech impediment as a child. So, so growing up, I didn't want to be heard um, because I knew that that was just going to open up a, a, another possibility of being made fun of. Yeah. Um, so, so for me, there was a lot of this like work hard, keep your head down, do your best, um, earn what you need uh, and, and put in an effort, like put in an effort. Like I have these conversations with my kids to this day. Um, so if you put an effort in, um, then, then the goal there is 
something will come out of it. Now that Mm -hmm. didn't really manifest in, in sort of like a larger way until I got to college and I got cut from the soccer team. And I think there's a little bit of lore out there in the world about, all right, I got cut from the soccer team. And then I started up gag reflex, which is the improv (laughs) group at Wesleyan, like two days later, right? One door closes, another door opens. And that was exactly what my dad said to me too. when I was like crying to him on the phone that I got cut from the team. Yeah. I was like, you never know. It might've happened for a reason, right? Like, the fates again there's that 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 italian sort of like how appropriately irish irish like and and like eastern european catholic philly yeah yeah totally right and my mom's irish and my dad's italian which Perfect. like back then was like <laughs> what are you doing dating the italian you know like it's a it was a sin um <laughs> so yeah so so i think there was something there too about like the way that seniority works in those cultures, yeah. like it's the oldest and yeah. and generally male skewed as well. Yeah. Um, and I just felt like, how is that, how is that what, what dictates who gets what, you know, mm-hmm. it just, it always struck me as so odd and I didn't have any of the words to really put to it until I got into gag reflex. And I saw that there was like a totally different way to do it, which is that every voice in the room matters. And every voice in the room yeah. can A, lead, and B, follow. So there was the sense of the wisdom of the room is far greater than any one person. And then that further got defined when I met my partner and she was studying public health at the Mailman School of Public Health up at Columbia. And I got to sit in on some classes and they were going wow. over frary and pedagogy around doing yeah. uh, what's called community-based participatory research. And I got to frary that way through community outreach and health work. And right. then I started reading all of frary's work and there is the theater of the oppressed and the pedagogy of the oppressed. And I was just yeah. like, this is in words what I have been imagining in practice about how the room is greater than any one person, especially undoing colonialism and all of these like very, very, uh, you know, Catholic centered beliefs around hierarchy and all that stuff too. So it was like, it felt like a salve and all of that, I think sort of formulated in, well, if I'm in this space and I'm sort of the facilitator of the space, then that has to be imbued. Like as a white cisgendered male, I have to be willing to be vulnerable, willing to be humble, Uh, and really, really be changed by any idea that comes into that room uh, other than mine. And that's my job. That is like first and foremost, my job. I suspect there's probably an element of leadership to that when the person who has the least need to be vulnerable in the room in terms of pre-existing social status and privilege makes that decision. It invites more people to take that step, take that risk. I agree 100%, right? I think leading with vulnerability, especially right now in the way the world is, is a bit of the medicine that that we all need, whether it be in, in public performances or in uh, private businesses or publicly yeah. held companies. Like, I, I really believe that's the way forward. You've given us this incredible gift of building off of all of the time that that you've led up until this point and and we will come back to the early days of freestyle love supreme but where that journey has taken you most recently has been to forming uh, this new collaboration between uh, freestyle love supreme academy and with your company speechless which does it as you as you explained it to me applies principles of improv to like the c-suite to to that sort of business to business model and you created freestyle love supreme plus i'm wondering yeah. when you think about how big that that is and mm. the the world of leading with vulnerability that you just described how do you keep those sorts of principles of vulnerability and openness and leading from the room when things become a system of systems and lots Mm. of different people who are bringing incredible amounts of influence, reach and capacity get involved. Just, just going for the small questions today. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, I always, I always um, use a, a bit of a metaphor on this question, and it's, it's about um, orca whales. So, oh, yeah. well, I guess are they even whales? Right. This is a good question. But apex predators in the ocean, right? Like these incredible, yeah. incredible species, um, and they, they travel in packs or pods. Um, and they do this incredible um, feeding mm -hmm. and it, it happens like once a year or so where it's, it's a hyper frenzy of feeding, but the way they do it is one sort of pod leader swims really far deep and they see a school of fish and they start a motion in which they will clockwise be moving underneath of this school of fish. And they are following the followers, right? So then a bunch of yeah. other members of the pod start getting into this swirl that they make. And this oxygenates the water and their swirling creates a bit of this like giant vacuum that raises yeah. all of these school of fish to the surface for then every other pod member of the, the orcas to come and feed and to feed for what will like keep them well fed for months. And I think that's exactly what my concept of leadership is. That it's a bit of an invisible swirling of energy that happens with no one really knowing like that leadership needing to be seen or felt, but yeah. rather that it is happening there and a container is being well made that then people can feed all they need to to sustain themselves. Uh, and to make their work more viable. So that is like the metaphor that I use when I talk about leadership, especially from a white cisgendered male perspective. Yeah. Now, the other part of this is the, the, the orcas that are feeding, those should be people of color. Like those should be people of color on the main stage, mm -hmm. having their full selves be seen and heard by people of color in the audience and not you know like everyone right like i want that audience to be also really really representative of the world that i want to live in yeah um, and that's how we sort of talk about it often too right which is what does the world we want to live in look like and then how do we represent it because that's the best we can do we can't force the world to look that way but we can help create the environment in which we make it look that way what is the what are the little sort of practical things that that you sort of any like little tricks or 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 thing or hacks that that you use in like the smaller decisions because mm -hmm. beca because I I know you to be a very detail oriented person too which probably is what makes you such a good CEO is that you have you have the thousand foot view but then you can get in at the sec centimeters too mm -hmm. um, what are like the the little of of course I mean. It's true. Um, but what are the little things that you do in, when it comes to like the smaller decisions or or the the sort of instinct relying changes, decisions that you, that you make to help sort of keep all of the little things moving towards the bigger goal? Mm. Big question again. Um, I, I, I love it. Uh, for me, it, it has to do with play, deep listening. Yeah. and creating space for people to be their authentic selves. Yeah. So almost all of our meetings start with a bit of play. So yeah. we, the very first thing we do a check-in, just like we did at the academy, like during our classes, yeah. red light, green light, yellow lights. Uh, and if you want to talk about it, great. If not, that's totally fine. We'll respect whatever light you are on and yeah. we will interact with you appropriately. Um, and then again, you know, how, how can we create a, a bit of playfulness right there at the top to say, yeah. yeah, we might be working on something pretty serious and it might feel big, but more importantly is the, our connection to each other. Yeah. So that's huge. And then this helping people to be authentically themselves, it takes deep listening. So I really try to have one-on-ones, uh, especially when someone is really getting their feet wet uh, with the company and to just ask them what their crazy dreams are, right? Where, where do they yeah. see this all going? Where, what does the journey of their life look like? Um, because if, if we can be a small part of that, like that's the best you could do. Like mm -hmm. you're never going to be the container for 
for everything, right? Like this is my crazy dream, right? <laughs> the, the FLS Plus is this sort of fever dream of mine uh, to bring improv to as many people in the world so they yeah. can use it as a tool to, to be the best version of themselves, to, to find play, uh, to find neural connections and neural networks that allows them to get away from their fear center. To, to stop being dominated by the fight or flight uh, that our brains have been evolutionarily over millennia designed to do. Um, so it really takes a lot of, of attention to be paid. So when you have those one-on-one -on -one meetings, hearing people's crazy dreams, and then, okay, well, how do we help you to get to that crazy dream? What mm. inside of this organization feels as though it might be a good match for the skills you are going to need to get to that crazy dream of yours? And then once you start matching people up with those skills, they know that this is heading towards that bigger picture for themselves. Yeah. And it also fits to the bigger picture of your company. Yeah. Um, we're, we've, we talked a little bit about the, the bigger picture of improv. I want to... I want to drill deeper into the concept of improv a little bit. We're all in this space of transition. Mm -hmm. We we all survived a pandemic. S some yeah. of us, like the brilliant Freestyle Love Supreme Academy and the the stage show Freestyle Love Supreme, um, made our best intentions at improv and musical improv on the internet um, yeah. with varying degrees of success. Yes. And, and by the way, we would not have been able to do that without you, Dr. Paul, your leadership around how to transition to those shows. Mwah, gorgeous. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's, that's very kind. Um, uh, listeners, I'm blushing. Um, viewers, um, oh my goodness, the video cut out <laughs> for like 30 <laughs> seconds. I no, am I so sorry. I, I can totally <laughs> see you. <laughs> oh okay so i guess i guess well i guess i guess the blush will have to be in there um but but i i think if there's one thing that i'm observing as the world to the world of improv starts to reopen is that the landscape is changing a lot the second yeah. city now has corporate ownership and the former sites closed the improv olympic is closed all of the former sites of the upright citizens brigade are closed and certainly in Philly, the primary theater like went through went through both economic issues and a Me Too experience. So, can you tell me a little bit about the future that you see for the local improv experience, for especially mm. for someone who might be new and and trying to get into to comedy improv for the first time. Ooh, I like this. You know, I think there's obviously always going to be a big place in each community for a mirror and a window experience. So what do yeah. I mean by that? I think that theater can often be a window in which you look into and you sort of see this, this version of the world that you're looking for, but it yeah. can also be a mirror, you know, theater and, and generally in theater, it's one or the other, right? So yeah. it's a window you're looking in, you're kind of seeing this world you want to be a, a part of, right. or it's a mirror, which is like, oh, this is the world I live in. Ouch. We, we've yeah. made a lot of bad choices, <laughs> you know, generally. Yeah. <laughs> most, most theater sells that. Um, and, and it's true, right? Like that, that's the role of theater. Yeah. Now, improv, I believe, is both. Improv, I think, is a window and a mirror all at the same time, which holds a very unique role in the conceptual model of theater. Mm -hmm. So if you can be both a mirror and a window, I think people can have very cathartic experiences under those yeah. circumstances, both as performers and as an audience. Because as a performer, you can just say, I'm not just playing a role here. This is who I am in the world. This is mm -hmm. what I believe in. This is, this is what I think is important. And I'm also now I'm going to play Shelley in one of the worst days of her life. <laughs> um, so that to me has a huge role in how our society needs to heal right now yeah. because I think people just feel so isolated people just feel especially during the pandemic uh, yeah. and so in that isolation we're kind of hearing these these echo chambers of social media which are telling us and they're 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 paying to tell us this message that stuff's bad that people are out to get you. 
I mean, there's all of these nefarious agents out there who really want to sow discord <laughs> wherever they can. And it's to the highest bidder, right? Like way to go, Facebook. You're making a lot of money, but late stage yeah. capitalism is leading to the tearing of the fabric of, of what we socially have agreed to as a society. And so that's not a small thing. Like that is a very, very big deal. Um, yeah. And improv, local improv, I think is this place where we actually get to hear in real life what it is, not hiding behind some wall where you feel no one's going to be able to threaten me uh, or no one's going to be able to put my voice to my actual person, um, mm. which again, that cloak allows some of the baiting. It allows some of the, the, the trolling and the bullying behavior, which I think is for better or for worse, the, the, the crux or the linchpin of how social media works. Mm. Um, and I think it's for the worse, but, but these local scenes, allow us to have that cathartic experience where we go through change together with others. And when we're together yeah. with others going through that change, we syncopate our hearts, our hearts beat as one. Uh, and we start to mesh wire with each other, right? Where we're like, Oh my gosh, we're going to be all right. Like yeah. my goal and, and my hope is that we're able to create sort of this like digital platform where people can get a taste of that so that they then go to their community wherever their improv scene is and then get that taste and then walk out singing we gonna be all right like if right. if that's where this can go amen thank you also um nefarious agents you heard it here first that's going to be the name of my improvised hall and oats cover band because that is a phenomenal that is a that's a phenomenal improv team name right there who could it be now yeah nefarious agents definitely uh that's a that's a that's amazing um so we we, we can't talk about anthony veneziali we can't talk about to touch without talking a little bit about the the origin story of freestyle love supreme you have the the tv show that was formerly uh, that was formerly on what was it pivot i think um yes, yes. you have a you have a very very old film of of the 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 concept and then we have the current stage show and the two broadway ones and we have the the newer documentary on hulu uh, one of the things when we were getting ready for this conversation that you mentioned is that in all of those media, the constraints of telling that story in those spaces is that there's only so much time and that there, there, there has to be simplified into the course of 90 or so minutes, if you get lucky, a story that encompasses 20, nearly 30 years now. I'm wondering if there's any parts of the of of the story of freestyle love supreme that you'd like to add a little bit more detail mm. to mm. uh well for me there's this this really big moment obviously where i sort of leave new york and the group mm. is like well are we still doing this yeah um and i always imagined we would absolutely still do it it's just it would happen a little less frequently mm. um and the making of that true is sheer grit that sheer philly right there come on gritty <laughs> um where you're just like no this this will continue i will make sure that it continues and one of the ways i did that was by sort of starting up a sister group out in san francisco called the freeze so a big part of the story that kind of gets like left out quite often is there was this whole group on the West Coast that I started because I moved there in 2006. And a lot of those people became very integral to the future of not only Free Cell of Supreme, but also Hamilton and a ton of other shows, right? That is yeah. where I met Davi Diggs. That is where mm -hmm. Jelly Donut got involved. That is where we had our first women being represented inside of the group, which is something I always wanted to do. And when we started out the very first seed of what freestyle of supreme was was tavi fields female identifying lin-manuel miranda myself and darren lorenzo 
So there were four MCs vocalists and one of them was a woman. And mm. it was very important to me to always try to have, again, this is it, right? This is, this is my view of theater. Like theater is about showing diverse perspectives on stage so that we can change and grow together. Mm. That is it. That is why I do theater. That is why I think theater should exist. Um, but when you move away, uh, and there was there was a uh, a moment in one of the two thousand. It was August fourteenth, two thousand and six. Uh, there was a show we did at Ars Nova two days before I left, and it was sort yeah. of like the hey, let's have like a little bit of a going away show for Free Cell of Supreme. And in that show, uh, we got the word rope for true. And I did a rap. My verse was about chapter 68. I think it's chapter 68 of Moby Dick, which is entitled The Monkey Rope. Mm -hmm. And The Monkey Rope is, again, like there's so many great <laughs> chapters of that book. It's my, one of my favorite books. <laughs> it is a rope that is tied to the person who is standing on the deck and the person who is carving the whale, mm -hmm. <laughs> comes back to whales again, on the side of the boat. <laughs> Right. And the whaling industry is like the beginning of the industrial revolution. Right. Um, we've got this whale on the side. It has been killed. It is being harnessed for its oil and its blubber. Yeah. And one person is like on the side and there are sharks trying to eat that whale as you are doing the work that you are doing to extract the oil from the whale. And you are tied by a rope to the other person on deck. Now that monkey rope, if anything were to happen to you, it would happen to the person above. Mm. So if you fell, they would fall and they would need to support you and bring you up. If they lifted, you would be lifted and you would go up. That to me is the perfect analogy for what Freestyle Love Supreme is. We are a group of people who are tied to these monkey ropes to one another in which when someone goes up, let's call it on the mizzen mast because they are experiencing the most success a human being can. The rest of us go up as well. Now, we might not be at the exact same level, but we are definitely on a raised level for sure. And if someone's having a rough time or going through something difficult, we will go down and we will be with them. We will help yeah. to raise them back up. Yeah. So that to me is, so that was August 14th, 2006. I do that verse, Monkey Rope, and it just sort of is seared into my memory as a moment mm. because that was before in the Heights even went to Broadway. That was before right. Hamilton ever even had a mixtape. Um, and that mm -hmm. moment, I think, really still resonates. And it's what I think of, that's what the freeze was, right? The freeze was yeah. this great group um, of people who, who had each other's backs and the first real you know, female troops in a performance way because Tavi did not want to perform. Like when we were trying this out in 2003, Tavi was like, I like jamming with y'all, but doing this in front of people sounds like a terrible <laughs> idea. And, and Ars Nova, like, like that, that room, like that is a very like vulnerable room. Like oh, everybody yeah. sees yeah. everything. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there's no hiding. There's no hiding. And I love that too about our show. Yeah, There's no yeah, hiding. Yeah. Like I don't want anybody to hide, like bring yeah. all the things. So, so for me, a big part that's always missing from sort of the story of free self Supreme is the story of the freeze. So Davi Diggs, James Monroe, Idle Hart, Jelly yeah. Donut, Kira Gordon, Lauren Nagel, Brian Rodvian, Mike Smith, Olive Mitra, Sanjay Pardinani. These people would put, we would put on shows and it was a bit more of like the roots because we had a full band. So we, mm. Olive was on bass. Sanjay was an incredible percussionist who's like, you could listen to a triangle solo by Sanjay for two days straight and mm. not get bored. Like he was that good. Um, Mike Smith was a jazz guitar player. And then Brian Rodvian was our drummer. Kira Gordon was our keyboard player, but also vocalist. Mm. So it was a really dynamic group. And like so many great things came out of it, including us staying sharp with the job, right? Like, yeah. As a freestyler, if you are not freestyling, it's like speaking another language. Like it atrophies, like it goes away. So if you want to be ready and if you want to have a show that's consistently going to be great, you have to consistently practice and do the thing that you're trying to do. Yeah. And so I got to do that with the freeze. And more importantly, I got to bring the freeze with me back to New York. So there was mm. a moment where we didn't have enough performers for a gig at comics. And I was like, Diggs, please come out to New York with me. Like whatever you have to do, let's go. Like, like just get you out there. 
And that's when he met Lynn. And like two weeks later, Lynn was like, gosh, I'm going to be doing this reading. And I think Diggs, he's so good at fast rap. What if we have Diggs come yes. and, and try this thing out? Right? Like those are crazy little stories. Those are just some of the, the, the granular details of how this organization lifts each other and loves mm-hmm. each other. You know, it's, it's, it's grounded to, I believe in the feeling of there's enough to go around. It's not a scarcity mindset in our group. There is enough to go around. Mm -hmm. There's plenty to do. There's always more to do. (laughs) There's always more to do. Um, so you, so you moved to, you, you moved to San Francisco yeah, and then you came back, um, like you you have a partner there um you um you you have you have a kid um and you move back do, during the the lighter parts admittedly but you move back during the pandemic what yeah. has the, that experience of of transnationally relocating and and parenting been like under 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 semi lockdown conditions been like for you Whew. Um, it's been really, really difficult, (laughs) Polly. It has been, um, well, well, for so many different reasons. So I'll try to unpack this as as best I can, but we moved last summer. So it's been a year now since we moved. It was August 4th. The kids moved in with us. And I think we got our place like the third week of July and we're out in Brooklyn and we're coming out of the pandemic and our kids are living a great life in San Francisco because in the pandemic, we lived with two other families. So we'd have sleepovers like every weekend. We'd have family meals three to four Mm -hmm. times a week. They're just spending time with their best friends all the time because there was no school. They were learning at our houses. So three days a week, they were at our house with their best friends. So there's six of them at our house most of the time and family meals. And that's just like every kid's dream of growing up is that. And then we moved to New York and we moved to New York because Carisi and I had made a decision that it's probably in the best interest of my career to be in New York City where most of my collaborators are, right? This is where most of the freeze has moved here, right? Like (laughs) even the people I started doing a crazy thing with out there relocated to New York. Um, And so the people that I I sort of make art with are here. And we made that decision and we made that decision in like July of, sorry, January of 2020. And I'm looking at houses in March, March 12th of 2020. And like three days later, it's a lockdown. And so I fly back home. Uh, our our house was on the market and we sold we were selling our apartment in San Francisco so we knew we yeah. had to move out of our apartment but we because of the pandemic we were able to negotiate and say can we please stay until we find another place in the city t- to move to in San Francisco yeah. so that was terrible but what really really sealed the deal of terror was that we get here to New York and my kids start a new school and there is mm-hmm. absolutely zero social life for them outside of school Because the pandemic is still going. And so they cannot really be with other kids, which when it comes down to it, if your kids have friends, everything's going to be okay. If your kids do not, it's, it's going to be a hard road. And it has definitely been a hard road because then you add into the fact that you moved here for your dad's career. And within three, like three months of, of all of that noise, like another Broadway run is starting up and I'm going on national tour. Mm -hmm. So imagine you are on national tour with a show you created, which is the gift of all gifts. You cannot believe that you're reopening these theaters. You're at a Broadway run and you can't see your family because they're not allowed to be a part of any of the backstage elements because of COVID. So I cannot hang out with my family while I'm doing these things. And so my daughter's, cry themselves to sleep every night. And I'm on the road. And it's a dad who's really active and involved in their lives is one of the hardest things I've ever gone through. And 
I'm still unpacking it. I'm still, I mean, the, the ending of that tour was, was great and very important for me, but equally yeah. important for my family. They, they get their dad back in a lot of ways. Um, I tried my best to, to come back as often as I could, but my partner felt like they didn't have a co-parent anymore. My children felt like their sense of stability and security was gone. My youngest is having nightmares. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot. And the goal for me is to sort of have it be a comet tail that dissipates yeah. and to slowly sort of like that MC Escher. And another one is the MC Escher drawing of like yeah. one hand's drawing and the other one's erasing. Yeah. I, I was needing to erase myself from the current narrative of the crew because A, I'm holding them back too. Like I'm sort of stopping and starting and being a part of the show, but yeah. our show is really reliant on the way humans absorb each other. So, so yeah, so the right thing to do in so many ways was to step back and to say, I don't need to be Mike one anymore. And I don't, the show is in great shape. And in fact, it's better without me, um, with the current crew for sure. Uh, will I come back and do special guests? Absolutely. Yeah. Am I still a part of freestyle? Yes, of course. I'll always do, still be a part of freestyle. I'm going to like help coach the next phase, whatever's happening next. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll sort of be in the background doing some calls and, and chatting with everybody and, and making sure they feel supported. But uh, for me, uh, my goal this year is to have as many home cooked meals as possible. What is wh wh when you are cooking, what is your favorite thing to put on the table? Mm. Well, you know, it's really hard because I love to make uh, a sustainable farm raised salmon. Uh, I'll mm. generally do like a, it's a bit lime soaked, salty, and then you put a little bit of honey at the very end when you broil it to crisp Ooh. the top. Uh, and then you put some furukake on the top and have it with rice and like, you know, broccoli. That is definitely one of my favorites. I make that every week. It's it's generally the Monday night meal. But my youngest daughter, O.C., is starting to not want to eat any animals, including fish, <laughs> which is great because we're pescatarians. But yeah, so so I'm I'm shifting for sure. I'm I'm always trying to find the thing. But I, I also love making eggplant parm. It's really labor intensive. If I have enough time, I'll do an eggplant parm. My, my grandmother taught me how to make it. It's it's incredible. Um, tasting. I don't know if I, I make it incredibly. She, it melted in your mouth the way she made it. Um, and then sort of my, my other one is just a homemade red sauce. Like most Sundays I will like slow, you know, yeah, make a gravy as we call it in Philly. Um, and just let it cook all day and then make a pasta that night, um, for the kiddos. You're reminding me about red sauce. Like it's, we're taping it and the the tail end of august and yeah. you're back at you're back in in the east coast um there is there there is no like equi east coast equivalent to to west coast best coast um so it would be east coast not the least coast i whatever <laughs> um east coast sweet coast <laughs> so, I love it. Um, but um, you're reminding me that the Feast of San Gennaro happens very, very shortly from now in, in Little yes. Italy. Um, yes. Cannot wait for like deep fried everything. Uh, get me some Zeppeli. Let's go. That's right. Um, something I want to make sure that I, I don't skip over. I, it's such a gift to for, for you to share that story with us. It's we're we're very honored that that there is space in your story to to be able to talk about all of the different people of yourself that you hold together and that and and that in spite of how challenging it is and and how how you long for it to be better than how it's turned out that that you still continue to hold all of those things in tension tour family life a good zeppeli a, a good plank of salmon um is there are, are there thing what what is the process of of finding that sort of sweet spot of holding all of the things together like, mm. i think we as humans a a keep adding on right we're like yeah yeah i can do more i can do more quite often uh, and sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes we're like, I can't do anything. Um, so, so it's a bit of feast or famine for us, right? As human beings, I think for me, what I have to tell myself is when I am feeling like I am not enough, 
in any of the places that I am, then it's too much. Mm -hmm. Then there's, there's too much going on. So how do I consolidate? How do I consolidate? There tends to be, and, and maybe you'll, you'll sort of like the listener will understand that feeling of like, oh my gosh, I barely made it to this meeting on time. And then, oh my gosh, I had to come home and help cook dinner. And he got on the table, but like, it was only a miracle that it happened. And there's no honey on the salmon. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I forgot to pick up the furikake seasonings. Yeah. Um, And, and you know that you're not enough because you can see that you're letting the people around you who are the most important to you down. Yeah. I think that's the moment that you kind of have to realize, okay, if I'm not enough for any of the things I'm doing, I'm probably doing too many things. <laughs> um, with that said, I believe that energy is a, is a is sort of an eternal spring um, that that we all have. And sometimes the spring bubbles a little bit lower and sometimes it is gushing mm. um, and you kind of need to tend to the source of your spring. You kind of need to say, oh, right. The source of that spring is and figure it out for yourself and make sure you tend to it. Mm. You know, for me, it's it, like we said earlier, like sleep is a, not a joke to me. Like sleep is one of the things that I know makes my whole life better. It's one of those sources of my energy. So if I'm not getting a good eight hours a night, it's not going to be good. You heard it here, folks. Anthony <laughs> Vanziali for Sound Baths 2024. Um, what, what other things help you tend that spring? Gosh, you know, we all can do work around that, like that inner critic voice. Yeah. For me, it's always been the phrase good enough, hmm. good enough, good enough. Like e- even when I'm coming up short as a, as a dad, you know, like you have to be kind to yourself. Um, I'm, I'm, this is a big moment. I'm going that, that my youngest daughter is going through right now too. She, she says she's a bad person. You know, she's really, she's having difficult thoughts in her mind and she thinks those thoughts make her a bad person, you know? And that's just a big moment in life. Uh, I remember going through that when I was a kid too. And, and for me, it was about praying. You know, I got a lot of solace out of reaching out to a spirit that was bigger than me and saying, here's all the people that are important to me. Will you please watch out after them? Will you please make sure that they have all they need to, to, be, to live the life they want to live? And so she and I, every night, name all the people who we love. Mm. And it takes a long time. <laughs> and sometimes she'll be like, don't name all your friends tonight. I'm like, you're right. We don't have to name all. <laughs> um, but it's a moment in which you, you get outside of yourself, right? So many of us internalize and have that loud voice and we keep it inside and we keep it inside and we keep yeah. it inside. And I think externalizing and focusing sometimes on the outward, the others, the things that we are in service of can be incredibly helpful too. Hmm. Hmm. I want to pivot a little bit. We we talked so much about the what helps keep you grounded, what tends your spring, the journey that's brought you to where you are today. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited about one of the projects that you told me that you're excited about and that this yeah. is a very collaborative podcast project. Can, can you say a little more? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, the, the ink is just drying on a deal that I was able to, to sign with Audible um, around a new podcast. Yay! Um, that will actually have some video, ancillary video stuff as well, uh, called American Immigrants. And it's based on an improv show that I'd been doing for, for many years with a dear friend of mine named Vivek Vinogopal. So Vivek, like Cake, and I met each other in San Francisco, and he is a big part of FLS Plus as well. He is, he is a co-worker. I love to get to work with the people who I am inspired by. 
Um, and Vivek and I did an improv show where we would ask people for their, you know, their last names. Uh, and then we would randomly choose one of those last names and say, would you mind coming up and talking to us about the journey that your family went on to be here in this country? Um, you know, even if it was a 50,000 year ago story about the land bridge of, uh, you know, the Bering Strait, um, yeah. pretty much everyone has in some way come to this place. Um, and we love to hear those stories because we believe that sharing those stories will take a bit of the pejorative nature of the word immigrant away. Uh, we notice that immigrant is often being used as a way to denigrate or speak down to a population that for some reason is taking maybe whatever you are supposed to have. Yeah. You know, I think it's that scarcity mindset uh, again. Uh, but for us, American Immigrants is celebrating that journey and then creating a song out of that person's story. So the whole podcast is going to be a bit like an inverse song exploder, uh, which is that we hear these stories and then we start creating song, a song for that yeah. person's story. And our goal is to create these immigrant anthems where people can like sing about this incredibly difficult or joyful or painful or whatever the process was for that family or that person and how they conveyed the story to us. Um, and we will be bringing in musicians who have similar musical cosmology as the p people that we're interviewing. What? I'm, I'm speechless. I, <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> you realized it before I did like the, <laughs> all right. Um, there's, this just seems like the the perfect synthesis of all of the stories that you've been bringing together the the desire to 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 simplify to find the next stage and to to help create that world that you're talking about there's so much power in getting to tell your story and in, in getting to hear someone else's amen yeah yeah totally agree when you think about when you think about the hot days in brooklyn um where <laughs> where where we where we were beginning sharing um listeners where we were we were lamenting about how it's now it's now like the the next to last day of september but it's still hot and Mm -hmm. And at least today, I saw my first uh, internet ad for um, sweaters. <laughs> Always a clear indicator. Yeah. But it was the perfect ad because it said, yes, it's sweater weather, but it's still hot. It acknowledged it in, in the ad. So, so clearly, yeah. clearly we're, um, we're, we're both acknowledging our, 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 our awful climate change and and, and also mm -hmm. uh, the the impact of late stage capitalism and i'm yes. sure i'll get see my my first um coke polar bears ad or my first john lewis ad tomorrow um yes. so so you have all of these strands of transition that are sort of that that's that at least that that i hear that are that are starting to coalesce in life mm -hmm. Are there any sorts of things that you're reminding yourself or lessons that you've learned from previous experiences of transition that you hope will make this current season a more a a more joyous, life-giving, generative, or perhaps potentially at least less jarring one for you? And you're picking up a guitar. <laughs> Yeah, I think we should sing a song about this. This is a great question. Yeah. So I had this thought as I was taking my daughter to her first day of school today. And she's terrified, angry, mm -hmm. uh, unhappy, and potentially uh, going to do some, some property damage. <laughs> <today>. <laughs> um, and the thought I had was, A, everyone should be totally free to feel what they're going to feel. Yeah. Um, that I think that's super important. 
I want her to to choose happiness, right? Because there's a difference between being unhappy and being unwilling to be happy, yeah. um, which I think is is a really big thing for for everyone to 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 sort of come to grips with. Yeah. But also, you don't know what's going to happen today. Like you you just don't, right? You you have no idea. You could meet your best friend today. Like at any moment, you could meet your new best friend. Mm. And I think there's just something really powerful about like couching it in that way. I could meet my best friend today. I think that's just a beautiful thing. So I think we need to make a song called I could meet my best friend today. It's got to have a G and a C in it. There's just, you have to, right? <laughs> You're like, My best friend, today's the day. I could meet my best friend in all kinds of ways, but you, oh, no, no. you never know. Mm. You know, something as simple as that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, what a gift this time has been with you today, um, and and what a what what a what a wonderful gift it is to chat to you. Just one last thing to to muse on um, before we get going, because it's a half day. Um, and that's and, right. Uh, I have to go pick her up from her first day of school, and I I'm like, what's she gonna say? <laughs> um. So I'll. I I I I'll I'll love to hear the second verse of uh, it could be meet my best friend um once once you get her picked up um and uh and we'll tag it on the tag it on the pod as well but um the the last question that we're asking everybody here in the first year of the show what do you want the world to look like when you're done with it mm. Well, it's an interesting phrase being done with the world you know um, I don't think I'll ever be done with the world, but I know the world will be done with me at some point, which is great. Like this body has to move on for sure. Um, but I would love people to be able to have really hard conversations with each other, people to change with each other and to know that we're all one thing, you know, we're all, this is going to sound so crazy, but if you look at an octopus in the ocean and then you put that octopus on land, you know, it's, it's, it's going to have a hard time, obviously, yeah. but it will eventually evolve into a tree. It will become something more or other or different because the DNA of you, of me, of everything in this world is so intertwined like it's yeah. just all interlaced with each other um and to know that that there is a possibility for us to all successfully root for each other to make each other look and feel great everyone if if the world could like most people in the world could say that to each other uh then then i think the world could be done with me <laughs> Thank you so much for this time. And may we all be able to to say those things and change with each other that, that the world could be done with all of us. Anthony, two touch, Benitez Ali, it's so good to get to see you and chat to you today. Mm. Dr. Pauly, thank you, thank you uh, for having me and for being the incredible energy that you are in the world you are a lighthouse um, in these times and i hope you know that it is a bright beacon that you emanate my thanks to my guest anthony to touch veneziali you can follow him on instagram at to touch fls and check out his website anthony d veneziali.com Freestyle Love Supreme begins its las vegas residency at the venetian on november 10th Go to freestylelovesupreme.com for tickets. 
Thanks for tuning in to Uncommon Good with Polly Reese. This program is produced in southwest Philadelphia on the unceded land of the Lenny Lenape tribe and the Black Bottom community. If you enjoyed listening to the show, please support us by leaving us a five-star review and make a comment and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. It really helps people find us. Uncommon Good is also available on YouTube and Instagram. Follow us there for accessible video content and more goodies. We love questions and feedback. You can send us a DM on Instagram or an email at uncommongoodpod at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time, wishing you every uncommon good to do your uncommon good to be the uncommon good.